This could be a key moment in the next stage for combat flying. BAE is learning to see what pilots are thinking while they fly. There are big implications. The machine could either take over or present the information to you in a different way or hand control back to somebody on the ground. They are close to effectively reading minds. What you've got in front of you is an EEG cap. So these used to be monstrously huge things, whereas now, as you can see, it's quite mobile. Um, so the idea is that we can start to put this under the pilot's helmet and we can start to monitor them. Um, first of all, in the lab, so we've been using it to do this task here. It essentially represents the piloting tasks. Um, but what it allows us to do behind the scenes is up the workload level, so there's an easy level, and then we can change the difficulty of the tasks. Mm -hmm. So we get people to wear the EEG cap and the eye tracker. We've also got the wrist watches and heart rate straps, so we can get as much data as possible. Mm -hmm. And we get them to do uh, low workload, high workload, different types of tasks. And what will that research result in? ultimately in the pilot's helmet, so live during the flight we can start to see when they're getting overloaded, if they're getting stressed, things like that. And, and you can't do that at the moment? At the moment it's very much subjective opinion, it's up to the pilot what they think is going on and data is captured in a debrief session afterwards where people discuss what happened, whereas this you can get objective data. This has got 24 channels on it that fit all over the head and it's recording at 500 hertz. So it's a vast amount of information that can show quick changes in what's going on in the brain. Can I try it on? You may. Okay, I'm sure this is <laughs> going to be a great look. Um, Okay, so is this like CCTV for the brain, essentially? <laughs> almost, almost. I mean, unfortunately, it's not as clear as CCTV. I mean, it's, it's a lot of uh, different band waves that come off and a lot of data, yeah. a lot of just numbers, essentially. So we need a lot of help trying to understand what it's actually telling us. Yeah. So we're getting the data out and we're sending it to artificial intelligence, uh, AI labs and our computational engineering people to do machine learning on it. Yeah. There's so much data. It's like, can we start to tell with certain accuracy whether this is high workload, whether this is low workload, so we can start to build up a picture. How would it normally work? This is a, a wet EEG, so we do actually, uh, we put this on you when we're doing these sessions, and then we put gel um, in just to increase the conductivity between the scalp and the uh, yeah. sessions. But you, you can get dry ones, so we're looking to always to move towards those. The technology is just increasing at such a pace that yeah. you could, you're always looking at the next improvement. So the idea would be for th this would be part of the uniform, essentially. Um, Correct. Pilots would be used to being monitored like that. Have any of them expressed any concerns about that level of data from, from your brain being um, monitored like that? Not necessarily. There have been jokes about having to put heavy filters in it. Um, but essentially, uh, pilots are quite keen to understand anything they can to get that performance edge. So if they start to understand more about what they're doing and how they're doing it, or bits they may be better at than others, or may they may be struggling, then they can focus their training accordingly. Also, it helps with things like um, in training, instead of just relying on a subjective um, instructor, you can get data and evidence to back it up. So if we can start to monitor what the pilot is f experiencing, what mental state they're in, then obviously we need to let the pilot know if we were taking tasks away from them. So that's why we're looking at the human autonomy teaming. Can they work together? Can they understand more about what each other's doing? So yeah, if you start to get overloaded, so for example, um, when you see the videos of air crash investigations and all the alarms are going off and the pilot seemingly hasn't noticed, if we could sense that in your brain that you haven't processed that information, the machine could either take over or present the information to you in a different way or hand control back to somebody on the ground. These are all within the areas of possibility for a future fighter. The machine takes over can be a loaded phrase. So how are they going to work out when and what it does? A lot of the workshops we're running at the moment are very much looking at what we're calling the concept of control, of who should be in charge of what. Um, often uh, people are tempted to automate things just because we can. So as human factors specialists, we're coming in and saying, no, hang on, is it something we should automate? 
is this something that we still ultimately want the pilot to be responsible for or ultimately involved in those decisions? And that's where imagine the pilot, the operator, we're even calling them, will now will be in the future. They'll be doing less of the flying stuff. That is stuff we know we can automate uh, from the work we've done on UAVs. But in the future, the operator is going to be there as the decision maker. The idea is that the system will give them as much information as they possibly can and the pilot will be there to make the decisions and have that human input there. You're monitoring so many different parts of the brain. What else will you be capturing? What, what would it reveal? Um, well, it, brain science, it could, it could potentially reveal anything, but we, we wouldn't want to do that. We, we're particularly looking at mental workload for here, and that's what we're interested in. But also we've been looking at, um, we've been speaking with colleagues down at the RAF Centre of Aviation Medicine who are, th who are starting to look at, could it be there to detect things like hypoxia? or G-LOC, some more of the safety critical issues as well. Um, so it could be used for potentially a lot of things, but that's why the ethics have to be quite tight on it of what we want to use it for. And when we're doing assessments and things like that, everything has to go through the ethics committee. So when people are taking part in the studies, that's nothing for them to worry about. When it is precise pilots, it will have to be. That's the whole point, isn't exactly. it? That you know that pilot you know X that person. is yeah. working in a particular way because of... Yeah, and that's again the intelligent virtual assistant. Will you train together with your virtual assistant so it knows you as well as you currently know your crewmates who you go for a drink with in the bar in an evening kind of thing? How do you develop that relationship? Tell us about either. That's assistant. the intelligent virtual assistant. So the idea is if we're going to have this human autonomy teaming, then how do we avoid that trap of what's it doing now? How are they communicating? with each other. Um, so we've got lots of ideas of how that could happen. Voice being the most obvious one, but um, we know that in times of high workload in the aircraft, the voice comms on the radio can often be overwhelming and the last thing you want to do is stop and talk to the aircraft itself. You may want a different way of interacting with it. We're not going to take ways away, we're going to add different ways so it depends on you and depends on the task you're doing how you want to do things. So what are the other possibilities? The other possibilities, it could just be a straightforward Twitter feed, just a general readout of what you're doing and what's going on, who's doing what. We could do something in the HMI, the human machine interface, to show which tasks are under aircraft control, which tasks are under human control. You could almost futuristically have a 3D avatar. You could look over your shoulder and it look like there'd be a co-pilot there when there isn't in reality. And you could talk to them or talk to them as you would a traditional pilot to navigator in front to back seat. That's how far we've come with technology. That's how far we can do with the virtual reality, yeah. It's, it's all possible at the moment. And you think that that might be what Tempest does look like? Potentially. I think, I think one of the things we're quite keen on in Tempest is that customizability. So it's not just going to be one, you know, we're trying to use the technology so that people can use it to suit them much more user-centered like today everyone's phones are different you know your iPhone to my iPhone to whatever will will all look different because we all use it in different ways why shouldn't a cockpit be like that you want to make it as as intuitive and as usable for each individual so therefore why not tailor it to how they like to use things if you want to use the eye tracker use the eye tracker if you want to use the hotas use the hotas if you want to use voice control use it it's up to you and different tasks will maybe change which things you use for what. It's that flexibility that we're trying to build in right at the start. If you enjoyed this video, don't forget to like and subscribe to our channel.